Eh bien, messieurs, dames, bonjour. Nous allons commencer la première séance de ce matin. Donc, bienvenue à cette troisième, on peut dire, troisième et ultime journée consacrée au bicentenaire et au centenaire de grands événements qui ont marqué l'égyptologie. Hier, nous avons consacré la journée à Jean-François Champollion pour célébrer le bicentenaire donc, euh, du déchiffrement des hiéroglyphes en 1822. Et aujourd'hui, les conférenciers euh, que nous allons recevoir eh bien, se consacreront au deuxième volet de ce symposium qui est consacré à la découverte de la tombe de Toutankhamon par euh, Howard Carter. Donc, euh, nous allons avoir un programme très chargé, puisque dans la dernière partie également de la journée, nous allons avoir euh, une table ronde au sujet, donc, euh, autour d'un euh, sujet euh, brûlant. Alors, merci d'être présent ici en cette journée de Grand Prix de Formule 1. Ici, c'est la Formule 1 de l'égyptologie, si je puis dire. Et donc, notre tout premier conférencier est uh, Adrian Dotson. So, I will introduce him in English since his talk will be given in English. Uh, Adrian Dotson is a honorary full professor of Egyptology at the University of Bristol in the UK. He studied at Durham, Liverpool and Cambridge Universities being awarded his PhD by the latter in 1995 and was elected a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London in 2003. He was Simpson Professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo for the spring of 2013 and Chairman of the Egypt Exploration Society from 2011 to 2016. Professor Dotson is the author of more than 25 books, uh, both from Egyptology and also uh, on model, uh, modern naval history, including four on the Amarna period. So we are very uh, happy to be able to greet uh, Professor Dotson. Thank you, Jean. Uh, bonjour and good morning. My talk this morning is in some ways intended to really explain why we are actually having a debate this afternoon. Because for those of you people who are outside the world of Egyptology, the idea that history can be a debatable thing and that 200 years on from the first decipherment, we're still having issues like that. Sometimes I find sometimes people cause to scratch their heads rather. So what I want to do today is to have a look at the history of how we learned about Tutankhamun and his broader family uh, with a couple of case studies of where old historical ideas have had to be uh, fundamentally changed and also how some apparently bizarre ideas were once perfectly acceptable given the nature of how we reconstruct history. So in some ways it's sort of an overview of the question of how, this, how do we reconstruct ancient Egyptian history and how have we done that regarding the period of Tutankhamun and his immediate uh, family. So, it's worthwhile just pointing out a few differences between the way that history is written when ancient Egypt and some of the other um, early literate societies are concerned, and how we deal with the kind of history which ordinary history um, classes teach us. So, you know, we have, when with sort of modern, medieval, and classical history, we've got a reasonably unbroken sequence, the chronology of principal events is fairly clear. Debate tends to be around the details. The existence of ind particularly individuals and events is normally reasonably solid. And the areas of dispute are normally around areas of minor details and causes and motivations. And in fact, you could put not in front of all of those when one is dealing with much of ancient Egyptian history. When we talk about early literate societies, with I'm talking Egypt, Mesopotamia, we have 
the, 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 a lot of the sequences are floating. We don't actually have a fully agreed sequence going back from more recent times back into the past. The chronology is unclear or debatable. What are the chronological debate can actually undermine an entire broader scheme of history and the existence and status of individuals and, and, um, and events can on occasion be matters of debate completely. And those can really go down to fundamentals. And it's, so therefore it's worthwhile just bearing those things in mind whenever somebody is sort of looking at why on earth are Egyptologists opening what we thought was a closed question. And just to say what I mean by these um, literates of civilizations, we've got the first written texts, the preservation is intermittent, the chronology and history is dependent on a symbiosis between archaeology and texts. We also have issues of trying to tie in one civilization with another, and really anything prior to 700 BC, and this is very, very much in the period we're dealing with um, today, everything very much is up for grabs. So you know, we can only really talk about working hypotheses rather than trying to claim at any point that we are actually telling, giving it, reconstructing what history was. It's merely what the individual in question. And I think for the period we're talking about, I think there's probably as many different working hypotheses as there are scholars who actually seriously engage with the whole thing. And that will become amazingly apparent in the debate this afternoon. So how, looking at all those horrors, how do we sort of deal with, um, with producing sort of history? Just to put, again, to a bit of brief overview of how we get to the point where what you call, might call proto-Egyptologists are able to do something meaningful about um, putting together a history. As I think was, was highlighted uh, yesterday, we have our final um, hieroglyphic text, or well, debatable one anyway, at Philae at the end of the fourth century AD, this text here. And then following on from that and the triumph of the, of the monotheistic religions, there is very much a hole in any ability to... Um, there's very much a hole in our ability to... Oh, I guess the, the echo gone, excellent. Um, the, um, we, we're very much a hole in our ability to do things. And therefore, from the middle of the first millennium AD, right the way through to the 1820s, any attempts at reconstructing history of these, of ancient Egypt and um, associated civilizations very much depend on works like the Old Testament and also the works of various writers in Greek and Latin. And therefore, with the reconstruction which was possible from those sources, um, we have um, discoveries which when the first travelers start penetrating significantly beyond Cairo, uh, we start finding um, things which were very, very um, mysterious to them. I think the first, the first um, monument relating to the Amarna period we have um, to be recorded, as far as we can tell, is in 1614, where Cor Corsica um, copies one of the boundary stele at Amarna. That's his version of it, and that's the actual piece itself. Um, but it looks rather different, but the whole problem was that the whole what was being looked at just could not be understood in the context of what was known about the art from the classical world and how it was emerging in uh, Renaissance and, you know, and so on. So therefore, any kind of thing like this is interpreted through that kind of lens. And one always has to re recognize that any interpretations are always through a certain lens whether it be of contemporary understandings of art, uh, one's own theoret theoretical standpoint, and so on. There's no such thing as independent, unbiased assessment, no matter how much one might claim to be uh, practicing it. Even trying to be unbiased is a bias, so which all makes adds to the fun and games of the whole process. 
Then we get to the Napoleonic expedition, the, um, the produ production of the description did Egypt with the first reasonably um, accurate um, copies of uh, and, and plans of monuments, including the original, the first uh, map of the site of um, Tel El Amarna, although the um, the French expedition didn't go inland of the actual town itself, so they were not aware of the rock tombs in the in the cliffs far to the east. They just merely did a not a bad sketch map of what was visible at the time, which say for say for something which is probably done under pretty um, straight in, straight in circumstances, in quite a hurry, um, it's still not bad. And then as we focused as we focused um, yesterday. The, final, the initial decipherment of hieroglyphs through the Rosetta Stone by Jean-Charles Jean Poulion, uh, with also initial work done by Thomas Young. But it's, always, it's also worth undermine, uh, underlining the fact that it's not, at this point, 1822 is not the decipherment per se, it is simply a, a, the first sound approach to how to go ahead with the proper decipherment. It's not until the 1850s that we actually have it's possible to read texts in a fully coherent way and fully and starting to understand some of the nuances of terms. And the question of nuances of exactly what certain terms really mean is something I'll be coming out with in one of my uh, case studies uh, in a little while. In fact, from the point of view of reconstructing Egyptian history, a really important discovery had been made only a couple of years prior to Champollion's uh, Lettre à Monsieur Dessier, uh, when um, W.J. Banks um, discovered the um, king list in the um, uh, Ramesses the Second Temple at um, Abydos. This is now in the British Museum, um, where it got to after various vicissitudes over the next couple of decades. Um, but here, by the magic of Photoshop, I have restored it to its position on the wall of the temple at Abydos. And it is here, um, as it is now in the British Museum. Although recognised even really before um, it was possible to start um, figuring out the individual hieroglyphs and what the names might actually be, it was recognised as a really important source. But it's badly mutilated, and it really and it only covers some of the kings of the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. Prior to that, it's all completely missing. And indeed, it wouldn't a full king list going all the way back to the beginning of the First Dynasty would not become available until the 1860s when Mariette uncovered the uh, one in the other, in the Seti temple at Abydos. So when we get into the late 1820s, when the first attempts at really being made to uh, put Egyptian history together, what we have is an interesting combination of trying to use Champollion's discoveries to try and actually be able to read names and a few um, a few phrases here and there but also to shoehorn them into the structure which everybody who was researching this will have been taught prior to this all the various um, reconstructions of ancient history based on the sources which i mentioned earlier on and the first sort of example of how it all worked or to try to make it work is a very good example of how um, a scholar tries to make use of the newly available data and ability to process that data with the structure which he'd been brought up with through the standards of education which um, was common across Europe as to what ancient history looked like. And the person in question here is um, John Gardner Wilkinson, along with um, contemporary very much of Champollion, but who lived much, much longer, um, and somebody who had the advantage over many of his contemporaries, for example, Champollion or Rossellini, of being resident in Egypt for well over a decade. So while Champollion and Rossellini, their um, overlap with the actual standing monuments was only for the year or so of the Franco-Tuscan expedition, Wilkinson was able to work on the material on a much longer term basis, and by being resident, um, in uh, Luxor, he was 
most anything which any interesting which was discovered or happened he was aware of so he's in a very good position to try and maybe put these things together beyond Luxor he's also the first person to record the um prior the, the, the tombs at Tel El Amman, the first person to actually penetrate beyond the city and here um visiting with Edward Lane better later better known uh, for an Arabist but also an important early proto-Egyptologist here is um the, the sketch from the 1820s of the tomb of Ahmosa and a photograph taken from pretty well exactly the same position um, a few years ago. But um, Wilkinson was primarily um, present on in Luxor, and he had a, ho a home on the West Bank on the Sheikh Abdel Kerna Hill. Um, and here, just marked out here. And this is, this is his house. It was the tomb of um, a man called Amechu, during the 18th dynasty, Theban tomb 83. Here it is today, and the only surviving element of it is the, this bit of, of um, mud brick wall. But in its day, it was a quite a palatial residence, as you can see here with a uh, wood, wooden and brick loggia um, added to the front of it, with, the, um, with built with extra uh, buildings at either end of it, and here is the old um, facade of the of the tomb chapel itself the lady um here is um it is hay the wife of robert hay who who fund, fund who funded a major private um expedition to egypt in the 1820s uh, unfortunately never never published now now residing in the british library um she's interesting though because um she was bought she was a, she was a greek um brought in a slave market in um, in Cairo, Hay married her, and she ended her days at the Chatelaine of a, of a castle in Scotland, which must have been quite a contrast from being a. I think she was the daughter originally of a uh, of the mayor of a town in Crete, captured by slavers, sold in Cairo, and ends up in Scotland, which I think must have been quite a shock to her system. <laughs> anyway, on the West Bank, as well as part of his large-scale um, copying and noting of the tomb chapels which later transformed into his famous manners and customs of the ancient egyptians book he uncovered a number of new tombs and from the point of view of the study of Tutankhamun and his time uh, the most important of his discoveries was here on the Kunat Murai hill where he discovers the famous tomb of Amenhotep Hui the viceroy of Nubia under Tutankhamun and with some of the most famous uh, paintings, certainly when you're dealing with the um, Egyptian relationship with, uh, with Nubia, um, this famous scene. And also amongst the images in the uh, tomb is this one of the King Tutankhamun and himself. And although the names had been damaged, they were certainly still uh, readable. So Wilkinson, when he produces his first synthesis of ancient Egyptian history in 1828, six years after the letter Amosi Adassier, he is, I think, the first scholar to um, recognize the existence of Tutankhamun. However, what to do with him was a bit more of a problem as far as um, Wilkinson was concerned. Around the same time, um, Lord Prudho, later the fourth Duke of Northumberland, um, who amassed a large collection of Egyptian antiquities, which are largely now um, at Durham University. He had been one of the first to penetrate the Nile as far up as um, Jebel Barkal. And at Jebel Barkal, he found and took possession of two great um, granite lions which for many, many uh, decades have graced the entrance to the Egyptian sculpture gallery in the British Museum. And while they were passing through Egypt on the way up to Alexandria and then to be shipped to London, uh, Wilkinson was of course able to um, closely examine them. One of the great advantages to say have been being resident 
and well known as being the sort of leading antiquarian resident in Luxor and therefore um, looking at these things. Anyway, of the two lions, one of them um, has this inscription, which we are now we now know clearly is a dedication inscription by um, Tutankhamun to uh, for uh, some kind of work regarding um, Amenhotep III. Um, now is not the time to go into the, the arguments as to whether or not this is an unfinished um, lion completed by Tutankhamun or anything else. That's, uh, and then another can of worms I will avoid, will avoid for today. However, from the point of view of the story I'm trying to tell of Wilkinson and his engagement with um, Tutankhamun, he was able to read the name of Amenhotep III, which he was well familiar with from various monuments around, uh, around Luxor, and then also was able to read um, the name of Tutankhamun. And although he couldn't actually read the, exactly what was being said about this, he, was, uh, he recognized that Tutankhamun and Amenhotep III must in some way be linked. However, how they were linked and how and where he fitted in uh, was a bit of a problem because his main source of looking at royal successions was the um, Abydos king list. And when he zoomed in on the bit which includes Amenhotep III, and therefore on the basis of what he'd seen on the lion, he would expect Tutankhamun, Nebkepru Rey to be somewhere nearby. Um, he wasn't. We have the sequence Amenhotep III, Horemheb, and then on into the 19th dynasty, Ramesses I. So what does he do about Tutankhamun? Where is he? What's happened to him? At this point, Wilkinson's only uh, ob, um, possibility was to go back and look at the old sources available to him because he'd gone as far as new Egyptian sources could take him. So he went back to the old tried and trusted sources, which were regarded implicitly at this stage as being reliable. They, we, it's only, it took some decades for the world of scholarship to recognize how much was wrong and how much had become distorted in the transmission. So where he um, decided to, where he sort of, his eyes lit up, was when he looked at this version of Manetho, of the late 18th, early 19th dynasty, which is horrendous, which we now know is horrendously garbled to start with. However, his point of view, suddenly, he was, his problem was to find where a king might have disappeared to, which in the case was uh, as this Tutankhamun appeared to have done. And he spotted this, that a king called, called Aramaeus was um, said to have been banished and went over to, the, to Greece and founded the city of Argos. And therefore he decided, although the names looked absolutely nothing like, and we of course now recognize that Aramaeus is, probably, is, is Horemheb and Ramesses is probably Ramesses the first, but because you know, it's such a mess, I'm not, again, not to go into the problems of trying to work out what on earth uh, Manetho um, is getting at on where the source, his sources were getting from. But anyway, he decided, right, his solution to this was that Amenhotep III was Ramesses, Egyptus, and Tutankhamun was Aramaeus, and that's what happened to Tutankhamun. The reason why he, um, his name had been mutilated, because it was damaged, in, case, in both cases it was readable, as his name had been damaged in the tomb of Amenhotep Hui, and also had been damaged on the Proto Lion, that was his solution. So therefore, as far as he was concerned, the reason Tutankhamun was not to be found on the king list is that he had a falling out with his brother, Amenhotep III, went off to Argos, and therefore he is the founder of the great Greek um, polis of Argos. Now, that was soon fairly re soon um, regarded as recognized as being rather unlikely, particularly in view of the names and so on. And, it's, and looking back at it now, it, it seems quite a ridiculous idea. The similar, you know, some of the rather off the wall um, alternative archaeologists kind of thing coming up today. But it's important to recognize that in 1828, when 
Wilkinson was trying to do this, he was having to make the best of a bad job. And, and this was at least a working hypothesis, which, as far as he could see, explained the lack of Tutankhamun on the Abydos King list and tied in with what seemed to be what he would regard as genuine history from the source, from the source of Manetho. Moving on to sort of getting more data about the Tutankhamun and um, his period, we find um, Chris, Emile Chris Davant um, present when, in 1840, um, attempts were made to demolish the 9th and 10th pylons for building purposes. As some of you will be aware, during the period of, of um, Muhammad Ali's rush for modernization, lots of ancient buildings were demolished to make, to build um, sugar refineries, to build barracks and so on. And attempts were being made to do the same to the southernmost pylons at Karnak. This was actually stopped fairly rapidly. And in fact, when you compare the current, the, sort of the current state of the pylons with what you see in the description of Dilijit, it appears not a huge amount had been taken away. However, the first Talatat, the, build, the, the blocks from the structures of Akhenaten at Amarna were, 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 were noted by um, Chris Davon. And all, including this block, which is from a hunting scene of Tutankhamun, the first of first fragment, as far as I'm aware, to be recorded, which would have come from his memorial temple. Um, unfortunately, only one of the various blocks recorded by uh, Pris, um, which is now in the Louvre, still, is still recognised. The rest all appear to have completely vanished and were probably, uh, were probably destroyed. Um, it's not impossible they might turn up, but it's very frustrating. There's some interesting blocks amongst them, including this one, uh, but at the moment, all we can do is just thank that priest was around for it. The same decade, we have the great um, Prussian expedition led by Richard Lepsius, um, who does the first mapping of the um, city of Amarna. He also copies um, in the in the in the in the, in the um, in the tombs and produces the first published um, copy of the notorious um, Spencharé um, tableau um, in, in tomb two at Amarna, although uh, including making um, a uh, squeeze of the cartouches, which did a good job because those were later um, hacked out and stolen and have never turned up. One suspects, given the crumbly nature of the rock and the plaster, they probably fell to pieces in the hands of the thieves. But at least we have that data. And also there are copies which some of the other travellers had actually made, but Lepsius was the first to actually publish it. Um, and then, of course, we have the version of the scene which everybody is familiar with today, which is the one done, copied by... Um, by Norman de Garris Davis in the late 19th century, although in this version I've dropped in the uh, cartouches from the, um, from the uh, Lepsius, sque Lepsius squeezes. While he's in Egypt and while he's examining the material of the mana, um, Lepsius comes up with his first working hypothesis about who is who and how does it all things tie together which he publishes not so much under his own name, but in, um, in Bunsen's great uh, Egyptians, Egypt's place in world history, but in which he was being heavily advised by uh, Lepsius. And in fact, originally he was supposed to come under their joint names, but Lepsius decided not to in the end. But this was the basic sort of setup. And the, rec the idea was that pretty well all the protagonists at the time were all all offspring of Amenhotep III. Wing Horus, that, and be, and so Horus I, Horemheb being brother of Tutankhamun, and also Tay being another sibling. So interesting that sort of, and there's, there's bits of that um, genealogy, well, most of this genealogy we would no longer recognize today. But again, it was a sensible working hypothesis given what was available at the time. I think one has to always look at hypotheses on the basis of what they were 
trying to do at the time. And there's always this luxury of hindsight to say, well, of course, now we know this is all, all rubbish. However, at the time, it made sense. The issue is often, when you're looking at these things, is people then clinging on to ideas once their time has, is, has gone. And even worse, people simply taking what their predecessors had said as being the gospel, without then going back to work out where did all this come from. It's one of the reasons why I think the histori understanding and historiography of ancient Egypt which is really, really important to understand how we got to where we've got to. And also it explains for those who are on the sidelines, scratching their heads at why we can have the debate we're having this afternoon. This hopefully explains some of that away. More Tutankhamun um, pops up during the 1850s when Auguste Mariette, during his famous work at the Serapium, um, uncovers the, the burial of the Apis bull who is interred under um, Tutankhamun. So we have these rather fine canopic jars and the, these um, beads from the end of a flail um, inscribed with his name. And at the end of the uh, next sort of couple of decades, as things move on, we find sort of the, the a general view of who Tutankhamun was um, emerging from the work of, of Brugge here. And what's interesting here is that the big debate during the late 19th century and into the early 20th century is Tutankhamun actually a member of the royal house, whether son, grandson, or whatever of Amenhotep III or is he simply a nobleman who was married into the royal family? And this is the, and, and, and the, the idea that he actually is a nobleman who got lucky by marrying a princess becomes possibly the more dominant one, particularly through the work of Heinrich Brugge, whose history of Egypt became very much the standard one for much of the 19th century. So that's Brugge's take on the whole, on, on the idea. And very much in typical Bruges kind of style, who seems to be very, he's, he's, he very much is, has no doubts about the correctness of his approach to things. And when you look at his, there's a whole load of other examples I could give if giving with other periods, but Bruges is a, an interesting character from the point of view how his, certain, his certainty in writing um, very much influences people who then don't look behind that. And sort of as far as the general, sort of some more sort of ideas during the uh, mid part of the 19th century about um, what's now being, you know, what's going on during the Amarna period. This is Lepsius's sort of narrative version and, under, and this is showing the beginnings of understanding of the whole Amarna religious revolution, which is something which hadn't really been recognized up until this point. There were some ideas that Akhenaten was actually a, was a Persian from the Persian period. There's a couple of really quite bizarre ideas. But again, they sound bizarre today. But again, you've got this, this art which just doesn't seem to work with anything around the period where um, it would appear, you know, the, the first principles would seem to indicate where it is. And here's, here's Wilkinson's sort of take on the period as well. Again, there's still the idea there's something foreign about it all. The excavations of Flinders Petrie at Amarna um, in the early 1890s is quite an important watershed when we're looking at the question of the study of the period. Because first of all, we have our first real excavation of the city of Amarna itself, which is so crucial to the whole picture. And therefore, we have the first proper map it's only a sketch map, but it's a fairly extensive one covering the whole of what might, one might call Greater Amarna. Not just simply the city on the east bank, but the areas defined by the boundary stele on the, on the other side of the river. And in his publication of the season, he sets out um, his historical conclusions, which continue to be 
in the very much the bit in big handfuls the way we tend to look at the period. And the very fact the things he had to actually dim deny in that historical chapter just gives an idea of some of the ideas which had been floating around about um, Akhenaten before, that him being uh, a transvestite, a eunuch, and various other things. But it's interesting how quite a lot of, say, that a lot of this becomes the the received wisdom about the Amarna period, and therefore, and sometimes it's rather difficult for people to, to get away from what had been that basic structure. But from the point of view of the sort of next sort of, um, one of the um, case studies which I'm building into this talk today, and one important point was his discovery of various um, ring bezels and seal impressions including those of Smenkare, who had been known since at least Lepsis's time from the, uh, from the, from the tomb, um, team, tomb two at Amarna. And the first ones which he found here are all the ones with exactly the same um, name and titles as is in the tomb, Ankhkeperu Re, then Smenkare, Jessakeperu. However, in addition to these impressions with the name which was already known. He also found others with Ankhkepru Re plus an epithet, beloved of Nefakepru Re or beloved of Wa'en Re. There was no sign of any different nomen, so the assumption was immediately that simply that Smencha Re had on occasion expanded his pre-nomen with an epithet in the way that was quite common during the 18th dynasty, although the majority of kings preferred just their core uh, pre-nomen, plenty of them had a, an expanded version. So it was simply assumed that this is the same person as Svenkare, who, given he's shown with a wife in tomb two, um, is assumed to be a male. We then move on into the 20th century, with the work of the German Oriental Society by Ludwig Borchardt. And from the point of view of, of people's interest in the period, uh, one of the great um, items which everybody recognizes from the period, the um, head of Nefertiti was found just before the first, first World War, although not revealed to the world until the early, 1820, not 18, the early 1920s when it combined with a certain other discovery in the early 1920s to suddenly make these um, individuals who'd previously been um, matters of interest really just to the most, um, the most of a niche market of Egyptologists suddenly become global superstars. Also the period before the First World War has a number of other things which heavily influence later views, either ex implicitly or explicitly. Uh, for example, um, Arthur Weigel uh, wrote his Life and Times of Akhenaten, uh, which included his own take on the, the infamous Tomb 55 in the Bay of the Kings. We, uh, Weigel was a very, very skilled author as well as not a bad Egyptologist, at least as far as an excavator is concerned. He never uh, beyond that. And his, his, his eloquent reconstruction of how he saw the world of Amarna has heavily influenced certainly non-specialists over the coming um, century. And quite often some of the ideas which, one, get, which get, one gets thrown back at one when talking about this period are ultimately derived from him. And it's still available and, you know, today and with a nice modern cover. And it's one of the more sort of pernicious things is where you have things which were not bad for 1910, but are still available and we're giving the impression that they still actually are of some actual value. And this is one of those. And there's another, another individual, rather, rather more distinguished as an Egyptologist, of course, um, James Henry Breasted, but his history of Egypt, his, again, very, very well written, contains some very, you know, nowadays quite pernicious racist uh, material, but also has an almost un, unquestioning um, 
hero worship of Akhenaten. And that's his, sort of the, the sort of his final uh, conclusions regarding Akhenaten. And coming from somebody who had such a standing in Egyptology has also influenced how people wanted to want to see um, Akhenaten. And there's a whole there's a whole sort of topic of how that how that has um, found its way into sort of popular culture. Um, and if anybody wants to follow that up, I can only recommend the late uh, Dominic Montserrat's book on Akhenaten, where he really does explore how Akhenaten has been used by various elements in modern times to try and validate themselves. And there's a and the whole question of the use of ancient Egypt as a, validate, as a validator for people's ideas is again another, possibly a hot, another complete um, topic. Then after the uh, Second World War, as we um, are all well aware and saw um, in the documentary on Friday, the great discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb is made by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. Um, I need to say no more than we were said, than we were said on Friday night and of this. Although it is worth pointing out that from the point of view of the historian, the tomb of Tutankhamun was remarkably unhelpful. Um, there was a role, some roles which some which originally people got very excited about as being probably papyri, turned out to be rolls of linen. And really the only thing which came out of the discovery which really had historic Im impact, at the t uh, impact was the fact that he was a child and quite clearly a member of the royal family um, with the head, with his, his skull being remarkably similar to that of the notorious Mr. KV55, who whoever that is, is clearly a member of the Amarna royal family. So that was the really, from the point of view of really narrowing down working hypotheses the only it, all it did was really rule out the lucky nobleman option as i would call it rather than anything else although of course there is plenty of other material in the tomb which has significant historical input impact that was something which only unpacked slightly later on the headline stuff was simply of who he was as a person the early 1920s become very much a um, where um, Egyptomania um, grips big time. But in addition to the, almost exactly the same time that Tutankhamun's tomb is being found, the Egypt Exploration Society is beginning its work at Amarna. And a number of the people who were involved in that, particularly the final director, John Pendlebury, were very canny uh, publicity people and were able to Try, basically they're trying to get uh, people to donate money to the um, to the excavation process but they are being quite quite uh, producing quite vivid accounts of the um, of what's go of, 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 of their views on what's going on at Amarna in the middle of this the German um, the Germans finally release the, the the bust of Nefertiti onto the world so therefore so we often just think of Tutankhamun as being the reason why the 1920s and into the early 30s has this amazing upsurge in um, Egyptomania. It's also, it's fed in, we've got, and it's not so much Egypt, Amarna mania, but you've also got what's being fed in by the EES and also, say, the revelation of the head of Nefertiti. And amongst the sort of stories which get um, made up, what made up the, the working hypotheses which are put together at this period are a couple which have hung around for a long time and one of which is sort of my is the element which feeds into uh, this afternoon's debate one of them is the discovery at the maru artan um, temple complex a number of occasions where a royal female has been cut out of the uh, texts and her name replaced by that of Merit Arten, the eldest daughter of Akhenaten. And here we've just got, this is a, an example, which is now in the Ashmolean in Oxford, showing where that was. Now, at the time when this was noted, the only royal wife known of Akhenaten was Nefertiti. And therefore, the 
excavators and those working on the material jumped to the conclusion that Nefertiti, it was Nefertiti's name which had been erased here, and that there had been some kind of falling out with uh, Akhenaten. These ideas didn't actually note that her name had, was perfectly intact everywhere else as Amana, but it's very much when you make a discovery, you tend to sort of make the most of it possible. And as a result, we get the idea of a split, divorce, whatever you want to call it, between Akhenaten and Nefertiti, which still is to be found today. Um, certainly not, not many years ago, I was taking a tour to uh, Amarna, and the guide was com confidently telling us that Akhenaten and Nefertiti had divorced. And given the period we were talking about, also brought in the idea of Diana Spencer and you know, it, it, the whole thing. Of course, in the 1960s, it was recognized that Akhenaten did not only have one wife, he also had another wife, um, Kia. Um, and that it was quite clear that all these erasures were part of a much wider program of erasures of Kia. And it was her who would had a, um, a, a falling out with um, Akhenaten. But, so as I say, the idea of the Akhenaten Nefertiti divorce is still to be found stalking various sources and is one of uh, various zombie facts of history, uh, which I think is going to be very, very difficult to kill. At the same time, Percy Newbury, professor of Egyptology at Liverpool, um, started looking at the um, seal impressions which um, Petrie had found in context of one of a discovery in the tomb of Tutankhamun, which is this fragment of a wooden box on which we find the name of Akhenaten. Apparent, uh, a hitherto unrecognized, apparently, King Nefenefru Aten, and also Queen Merit Aten. And this King Nefenefru Aten had the long version of the Ankhkepru Ray prenomen we talked about earlier on, which was universally assumed to be that of Smencha Ray. So therefore, it looked like we had Smencha Ray had changed his name or changed his name from Nefenefru Aten. And this was then tied in with recognizing a graffito which had actually been recorded much earlier but not fully uh, properly um, assessed in the tomb of Pa'iri at Thebes where we have a, uh, a graffito which is datable to this Ankhkepru Ray plus epithet Nefenefru Aten. And therefore, um, Newbury equated these two, which was an equation which was accepted the right the way through until the 1970s. He also, um, by equating these two, brought into the mix this stealer in Berlin, which had originally been so, um, assessed by Heinrich Schäfer, the curator at Berlin, as being Akhenaten and Nefertiti, but with Nefertiti wearing a blue crown, un most unusually. However, um, Newbery put, didn't re rejected this completely, in spite of the fact there were only three uh, royal cartouches here, rather than the four you'd expect for, for two kings, by deciding these weren't Nefertiti and Akhenaten, but rather they were Smenkhare and Akhenaten in a very um, affectionate pose with both of them being naked. So therefore we have this in a rather sort of, in the rather sort of stilted twenties way of referring to homosexuality, we have this idea that actually Akhenaten and Nefertiti are gay lovers. And also, um, Newbery um, ties this in to the recent discovery of the, um, of the erased texts at Maruatan. And basically, his thesis becomes that the reason why Akhenaten and uh, Nefertiti um, got split up, divorced, or whatever, was because she didn't like the idea he was having a gay affair with Smenkhare. And that then became, again, fixed as a fact of history 
And indeed, in his book, Dominic Montserrat, who was himself gay, um, remarks that when he raised this problem with an audience, he was accused of homophobia for, de for denying a great, a great love story. So it was, it's become very much not only something in sort of popular understanding of Egyptology, but has now found its way into, into gay history as well, where it can be very, very difficult to... Um, take it apart. It wasn't until the 1970s that anybody, as far as I'm aware, questioned this in a, in a meaningful and systematic way. And this is where the late John Harris, um, who was the then professor at Copenhagen and later professor at Durham, where he taught me, um, but published very, very little, unfortunately, um, had a closer look at some of these um, ring bezels and seal impressions which, which Petrie had found and noted that a number of the plus epithet versions of the Ankh Kepru Re prenomen had something which shouldn't be there. And what he spotted was the fact there were two little blobs in the seal. Remember, these things are only about yay big, so we're not talking about having, it's a bit difficult to actually shape some of the signs. It was pretty obvious that these were the T signs. These were feminine endings. So therefore, we have anket kepru re mer mer et wa en re. So this doesn't really work very well with belonging to a male pharaoh. He then back, looked back at the Berlin Steeler and recognised that the that it um, had. The one of the figures, they look remarkably female. They're, even though, of course, you have this very androgynous kind of figure um, in Amarna art, one can normally, there is a distinction between the breasts of a man and a woman, and that's there. And also, he spotted, of course, that this figure, which from the Tuft of Al which had been thought to be a reused one of Akhenaten, also has female breasts. So, therefore, he recognized this must be the owner of these. Um, cartouches. He then, however, may have jumped, took one jump too far by saying that this was, that he still argued that these were the same person, but simply that Smenkare was a woman, as was Nefruaten, which of course then led to certain problems with why have you got Smenkare with a wife in Tomb 2 at Amarna. But it took a little while, and so, but there was, so this is a problem when, when, sort of the, when observations are made, and there was a period of um, significant debate. There's some other explanations were put together as to where the Anket Kepru Ray name came from, um, and a number of scholars were very, very sceptical, and I must say I was as well. Um, so that, but then it became, so the, let's say one of the major issues with that query is, you know, is that... Um, to, is that two women in there? Is that, does that work? The next sort of step forward really came when um, Jim Allen um, actually pointed out there was no actual overlaps between the two sets of cartouches. Although they're similar in the sense that both have got Ankh Kepru Ray in them, there is no example of a plain Ankh Kepru Ray being with the Nef Nefru Artem. Um, Nomen and vice versa. And so therefore, have, making this observation that it was either, it was an either or. The next step forward came uh, with a certain Dr. Gabold, uh, when he um, started taking a very, very close look at some of the material from Tutankhamun's tomb, much of which, as uh, Valerie will be um, exploring, um, has been identified as having been originally made for Nefenefruaten. Um, that particular cartouche, the cartouche at the top there, show ghostly cartouches underneath. But the uh, most exciting one um, is this one, whereby the epithet in that comes out as Nefenefruaten, beneficial for her husband, which suddenly took the wind out of any sails which still tried to argue that Nefru Arten was, was, was the same person as Menkare and a man. 
And that was the point which I certainly changed my views completely and had to rewrite a whole load of, um, of draft articles. So therefore, for most people, there are still a few who don't, but for most people, we now have the picture of a male Spankare, a female Ankhkepru Ray. And, but this, but the gay, as I say, the gay lovers scenario still hasn't been fully, um, is still out there, and that joins the Akhenaten divorce as one of the zombie facts of history. Further, de further development, recognition by Ray Johnson that's been able to reconstruct um, some more scenes from, from probably from Amarna, previously from Amarna tombs, from Amarna, from Amarna temples, found at Ashmanain, which is something I will sort of talk a little bit about this afternoon. So, to, to, as I sort of, uh, to give a precursor to this afternoon, who was Nefenefruaten? Well, various people have made various suggestions, and these are just a few of them. But for any further comment, wait till after lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. So, um, first of all, are there perhaps uh, any questions in the audience? And if you, uh, either in English, are there any questions? In which case, uh, please uh, move on to the microphone, which is right here in the corner. Or if there are questions, so please see if you can simply move towards the microphone that is there. Yes, Mark. Okay, Mark. The debate is already launched. Council, please. No, no, it's only to, to give you an information about the blocks uh, drawn by uh, Prise d'Aven. It is still in the second pylon. Uh -huh. And I've been able to draw the right part of it. Unfortunately, the main part of it is under the, the masonry of the, of the pylon, and the recent masonry built by Chevry. But uh, the block is still here. We cannot remove it. It's Im impossible. And most of the blocks uh, um, uh, that were drawn by uh, Prisaven are still uh, at Karnak. And right. I have recognized most of them. So. Oh, brilliant. That's so. wonderful news. So I had this horrible vision that they'd all been destroyed. That's, that's great news. Yeah. Merci. Certain.